I'm really excited to be sharing some key findings and recommendations with you today from our latest report called Planting Seeds, the Impact of Diets and Different Animal Advocacy Tactics. So this project means a lot to me, both as a researcher and as an activist, since I've engaged in many different forms of advocacy in the past, from protesting to video outreach. So it was really cool that I got to empirically study the impact of animal advocacy with this project. So the purpose of this project was to understand the impact of different forms of animal advocacy, such as reading a leaflet, watching a graphic video, learning about the meaning of welfare labels on people's behaviors and attitudes towards farmed animals. We conducted two studies in the United States to uncover this. So the first study was a survey where we asked people if previously experiencing advocacy reduced their animal product consumption or had any other effect. And the second study was an experiment that compared animal product consumption and other outcomes in people who saw advocacy versus those who didn't. So these studies in particular looked at individual behaviors, um, individual beliefs, and individual attitudes when assessing the impact of animal advocacy. So this project looked at 15 different forms of advocacy, which you can see here. But not all forms of advocacy from the first study um, could be experiment experimentally tested in the second study for practical reasons. So for example, asking someone to read an entire book or watch a two hour documentary would have taken too long to do in our experimental setup. And we also included vegan or plant-based labels on food items in the first study, just to assess the impact of an experience that raises a minimal amount of awareness of animal welfare issues. So it was only included in the first study just to help contextualize uh, the results of the other advocacy forms. So let's get into the results of the first study. Um, this first study had 4,000 participants from the United States. And if participants had indicated that they experienced advocacy within the last five years, then they answered follow-up questions about its impact, which was 52% um, of the sample. So overall, 41% of people who had remembered their experience with animal advocacy said that it caused them to reduce their animal product consumption. So in this graph, we can see that longer forms of advocacy, like reading a book, participating in a meat-free challenge, or classroom education, and watching a documentary, were reported by participants as the top four advocacy types to reduce their animal product consumption. In contrast, you can see that about 25% of people said that an advertisement or billboard or seeing a celebrity talk about farmed animal suffering caused them to reduce their animal product consumption. So although this study is really valuable in understanding the relationship between experiencing animal advocacy and changing one's behavior in response, um, the study was a survey and it did rely on people's memory and it was self-reported. So that just means that we can't be entirely confident that these forms of advocacy actually change people's diets. So for this reason, we designed an experiment in our second study. So as I mentioned before, in this experiment, we had people see a form of animal advocacy or they saw no advocacy at all. So if advocacy has a positive impact on people, then we should see lower animal product consumption in the group of people who saw advocacy compared to people who did not. However, um, we actually found that across the entire sample, there was no difference in any outcome that we looked at between participants who saw advocacy or not. So in that particular, in this particular study, we found that advocacy didn't actually change people's behaviors or had any other effect when looking at um, everyone's data. But as a result, because of that, we explored whether people's diets, so whether they identified as a meat eater or a meat avoider, explained uh, these lack of effects. And this is where we found some really interesting findings. So I'm going to cover three key findings that focus on people's behaviors, like their reported level of animal product consumption and their willingness to sign a petition calling for welfare improvements. So first, we found that news articles and social media posts actually reduced animal product consumption in meat avoiders. And by meat avoiders, I mean people who um, identified as vegetarian or reducitarian. So meat avoiders ate 1.3 to 2.3 fewer servings of animal products than meat avoiders who saw no advocacy at all. Um, meat eaters' diets, in contrast, weren't actually affected by these two forms of advocacy, um, so we didn't find harmful effects of news articles or social media posts for them. 
Second, we found that disruptive protest increased animal product consumption in meat eaters. So meat eaters ate 0.6 servings more animal products than meat eaters who saw no advocacy at all. And meat avoiders diet, in contrast, was unaffected by disruptive protest. So we didn't find harmful effects of disruptive protests on meat avoiders diets. But we found that both disruptive and non-disruptive protests actually reduced petition signing in meat avoiders. So for example, only 44 to 54% of meat avoiders signed a petition calling for better welfare standards after seeing a protest compared to 71% of meat avoiders who saw uh, no advocacy at all. So based on the key results from the experiment that looked at the impact of advocacy on individual behaviors, such as people's reported animal product consumption, we came up with recommendations for the different advocacy tactics that we investigated. However, it should be noted that behavior change does occur in stages, so we should still use tactics that raise awareness or change people's beliefs, as these are more important in the earlier stages of change. So keeping that in mind, based on the data, we do recommend social media posts and news articles because they successf successfully reduced animal product consumption in meat avoiders while they had no harmful effect in meat eaters. And we also recommend classroom education and meat-free challenges because they were described as behavior changing in study one, and they have also been supported as behavior changing by causal evidence in other studies. And further, based on the data, we weekly recommend graphic videos, leaflets, non-graphic videos, and celebrities because they positively impacted meat eaters' intentions or their beliefs, but they, didn't, they had no impact on behavior, which is why it's a weaker recommendation. And based on the data, we also recommend caution around using educational information about welfare labels, documentaries, and billboards, since the data from the experiment so far is the only study that has actually looked at the impact for both educational information about welfare labels and billboards, and we found no effects. So we didn't find that these two advocacy tactics had good or bad effects on people's individual behaviors. So we encourage further research. As for documentaries, they were not included in our experiment, but there is some limited research conducted by other researchers and organizations who also didn't find an impact of documentaries on changing people's diets. So we just encourage further research for documentaries as well. And lastly, based on the data, we recommend against using protest as a strategy to change people's diet, since both disruptive and non-disruptive protests had harmful effects in our experiments. However, no single study should be taken as, taken as definitive, and we really hope other groups and scientists will research the impact of protests on other count other outcomes that were outside the scope of a report. For example, um, its impact on potentially changing legislation, policy, or raising awareness of a particular issue. So we really want to help animal advocates and we're really excited to see what other groups are going to do to study the impact of protest um, to pro progress our movement. So thank you so much for listening. I also have virtual office hours every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And you can find more information about our office hours at phonolytics.org slash ask us. So I'll be happy to take any questions now. One second, please. This is what happens when you work with double monitors. Okay. Okay, so the first question is, um, how does cost effectiveness come into these recommendations when something like a documentary is obviously a lot more expensive than social media? Um, so we did not consider cost effectiveness in our recommendations as these greatly vary. So we encourage advocates and funders to include the relative cost of different approaches in their own decision-making. And I should also note here that the cost of an advocacy type should be carefully considered for the tactics that haven't been supported by data so far as behavior changing. So for example, documentaries or billboards. 
And although we did not consider the cost um, it takes in making these different forms of advocacy, I think it's a really cool coincidence that the two advocacy tactics that were most successful in reducing animal product consumption um, happen to be social media posts and news articles, which are generally easier to implement and are lower, lower cost than other strategies. So the second question is, do these results apply to other countries or different cultural groups? Um, so regarding the first part, um, it's likely that different forms of advocacy can be interpreted differently in different countries because the levels of exposure or familiarity with an advocacy type is going to be different in other countries. So it's important to note that countries have uh, different histories and norms for things like protesting. So our results, conducted in the United States or based on the United States can provide a starting point for advocates, but it should be really important to, for local advocates to determine how applicable these results can be and where differences might arise depending on the particular, particular strategy that you're interested in. So the third question is, what are other approaches researchers could take when thinking about replicating this kind of research question? Um, so in our experiments, we asked participants to self-report the frequency of their consumption of animal products two weeks after they viewed advocacy or not um, on a scale ranging from never to daily for the past week. So the experiment compared self-reported animal product consumption between people who saw advocacy versus those who didn't. Um, so I think that other researchers may want to consider using more direct behavioral markers of consumption. So for example, comparing the amount of animal products that people actually consume, like in a cafeteria or in a restaurant after they're exposed to advocacy or not, versus just asking people to report what they ate. Um, so another question is, are there any circumstances where I would, we would recommend using protests? Excellent question. So again, our experiments didn't support the idea that protests are effective in changing individual consumer behaviors. However, it's still very possible that protests positively impact other outcomes that were just outside the scope of our report. For example, um, getting media attention, changing legislation, or even improving community building. So there are anecdotes that protests have been um, a helpful part of pressure campaigns, for example, where the goal is getting a company um, to drop a certain practice or products like fur. And in other social movements, we know that, like in climate activism or um, civil rights, protests have been influential in bringing about social change. However, it's hard to know how applicable uh, those outcomes and lessons are in the context of animal advocacy, where we just generally have less public support and fewer people protesting overall. So while the results from our um, four protests from our report may be a bit controversial, especially since a lot of people strongly believe in the power of protests, we do really hope and encourages more research into investigating their, their impact with different approaches because no single study, again, is ever definitive. Okay, so it looks like those are the only questions we received. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. And again, if you ever have any questions about our advocacy reports, or if you want help uh, conducting your own research, you can again visit our website or our office hours. Okay, thank you.